Welcome to the first part of the RSET training, selecting climate change projection sets for mitigation, adaptation, and risk management applications. My name is Brock Blevins, training coordinator for the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. After participating in this two-part training, attendees will be able to understand differing needs of mitigation, adaptation, and risk management applications, recognize the main components and distinguishing factors of climate projection sets, summarize the benefits and trade-offs of different climate projection sets and versions, discuss selection of the best climate projection set for various application needs. Essentially, we aim to empower you in your climate projection selection process. The prerequisites for this two-part training is our sets fundamentals of remote sensing session one, and to review the content of the two-part training series from 2021, Introduction to NASA Resources for Climate Change Applications. The Fundamentals course provides a general overview of remote sensing and its application to disasters, health and air quality, land, water resources, and wildfire management. Those who take the Fundamentals course will become familiar with the satellite orbits, satellite types, resolutions, sensors, and processing levels. The training from last year, Introduction to NASA Resources for Climate Change Applications, provides an overview of NASA resources for monitoring climate change and its impacts. The webinar defines the terminology and the role of Earth observations in climate change assessment, and then provides an overview of NASA climate models suitable for emission policy, impacts, risk, and resilience applications. Today, in part one, we'll be covering what makes projection sets different, discussing key distinguishing features. In part two, tomorrow, we'll discuss how do you choose a projection set for your particular application. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend both live parts of the webinar, and you will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinus Martins. No, there will not be a homework associated with this training. For those who are new to our set trainings, I will quickly review our program. Our set provides accessible, relevant, and cost-free training on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods, tools, and applications. Trainings are offered online and in person for beginners to advanced practitioners alike. Trainings cover a range of data sets, web portals, and analysis tools and their application to air quality, agriculture, disaster, land, water resources, and climate. Trainings are freely available to anyone with an internet connection and conducted either live, instructor-led, or self-guided, such as the Fundamentals course. Since 2009, the program has reached over 80,000 participants from over 180 countries. We've provided a link on the right side to learn more about the program and we hope you sign up for our listserv to stay informed about future trainings. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Alex Ruain, co-director of the Climate Impacts Group at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City. Thank you for that introduction. My name is Alex Ruane, and I'm really happy to be here today to talk with you about how applications experts can select climate change projection sets for mitigation, adaptation, and risk management applications. Uh, I'm joining you today from, from New York City area, and uh, we have uh, a, a nice set of slides, hopefully, to, to guide you through this process. Uh, it's important to first note that we have built within our set a series of climate trainings. Uh, this is continuing from a, a two-part series that, that began last year on climate issues. Part one looked at climate change monitoring and impacts using remote sensing and model data. Uh, and part two was a training that I gave on climate change future scenarios, impact forecasting and adaptation. Uh, and these resources are available at the RSET website. The challenge that we face in terms of climate projection sets uh, is that there is a fire hose of climate data. There's a lot of climate information out there, and at times it can feel like uh, applications experts are blasted uh, by the sheer volume and, and number of uh, climate possibilities out there. Um, our aim in this training is to help experts and stakeholders make sense of that huge variety of climate information 
uh, so that there will be a process to select climate projection sets suitable uh, for a given application. Just to, to give you the headline and, and spoil the ending, we are not going to be giving you one recommendation. We're not gonna finish this uh, training and say here is your one solution, uh, but we aim to empower you in the selection process. And I think over the course of this training, you'll see why uh, it would not be practical to provide one solution as one of the bottom line messages is that the, the specific solutions depend on your application task. So the goals for this RSET training uh, is to approach the selection uh, of a set of climate projections to use in mitigation, adaptation, and risk management applications. How do we make that selection? So part one uh, in the first hour or so is going to, uh, to address what makes projection sets different. So we'll talk about the context of applications areas, uh, especially around these fundamental questions of mitigation, adaptation, and risk. Then we'll uh, go through where climate projection sets come from and spend some time understanding the key distinguishing features between climate projection sets uh, that might make them more or less appealing. Uh, the next part of this training will be given tomorrow. Um, and part two will look at how we choose a projection set for a specific application. So the goals there are to match projection set characteristics to a given application's needs. Uh, understand the advantages of using more updated versions, uh, look through the trade-offs in using more complex projection sets, and understand how supporting materials may make a projection set more appealing. So in this first part, we're gonna try to answer the question of what makes projection sets different. And it's important to start by understanding the context of various climate application areas. So as we're thinking about climate change, we are faced with, uh, with increasing climate change risk as we're going out into the future. So there are three options in the face of this increasing climate change risk. We can mitigate uh, some portion of the, of the climate change signal, so we have less climate change to deal with uh, to begin with. We can adapt our systems so that they are more able to withstand the climate uh, conditions of the future. Um, and we can manage the risk in terms of understanding the, the risk that's left over. Uh, how do we handle things like disaster risk preparations and, uh, and other actions uh, in the face of that risk? Now, even uh, under our best planning, we expect that that will be an incomplete process and that there will be some residual risk uh, in the end. As we look farther out into the future, of course, uh, with continuing emissions, the climate change risk will be higher. And this allows us to, to think about, again, maybe there will be a, a larger capacity to mitigate as we go farther out into the future. Likewise, a larger capacity to adapt and potentially more advanced risk management approaches. But even with, with improvements in each of these three areas, we may be facing a situation with higher climate change risk. Um, so in general, we expect that there will be a combination of all three of these response patterns. Um, we can still have losses and damages, even with substantial interventions. Um, there are, are costs and limits for adaptation and risk management, and risks and options grow over time, depending on our actions. And I wanna emphasize that last point again. Both the risks are growing because of uh, continuing greenhouse gas emissions and land use changes, um, but also our options are growing over time. We have improved technologies. We have, uh, in some cases, more inclusive government programs and, and, uh, and approaches that are, are making our overall ability to respond to climate change uh, uh, grow over time. And of course, technological innovation and knowledge sharing and other practices uh, are helping with this process. So I'm hoping that the people who are participating in today's uh, training are those on the front lines of trying to understand projected climate change risks so that we can understand mitigation, adaptation, and risk management approaches uh, all the way down to the ground level. Uh, of course, when we think about risk, it's important to understand various components of risk. Uh, the climate change signal begins with a changing climate hazard, things like increasing temperature or more heat waves or droughts. Um, but a heat wave itself isn't dangerous uh, unless it connects with some vulnerability and exposed system. Um, so when we put those three things together, we get risk. Um, 
and we also have to pay attention to the way that we respond as potentially influencing that risk. So for example, if we take actions to mitigate, what we're really trying to do is reduce the overall climate hazard. Uh, maybe make it so there are not as many heat waves or droughts in the future or that the overall global temperatures uh, are in a, in a safer range. When we're taking steps to adapt, in many cases what we're doing is we're reducing vulnerability and exposure uh, to specific types of climate hazards. However, as we're taking actions to mitigate and adapt, we may also be increasing response risk, uh, for example, through maladaptation. It's also important to note that climate actions connect with disaster risk reduction and sustainable development. Uh, climate and disaster risk reduction are fundamental elements of sustainable development itself. Um, and this really shows the synergies and the trade-offs across all three of these areas. And it's important to note that it is easier to develop if risks are lower. Uh, it's also easier to adapt if the amount of climate change is reduced. Uh, and it is easier to manage risk if adaptations are in place. So in many cases, when we're looking towards the future, we are, we are seeing shifts not only in society, not only in the climate system, uh, but also our ability to uh, connect those elements uh, and respond to disasters that may occur. So in the end, we're looking for this middle space, which is how do we reduce vulnerability uh, and enhance resilience? Mitigation application approaches generally compare two different future conditions depending on societal emissions. Uh, on the figures on the right, you'll see a couple examples of this. The top row uh, is a figure from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, their sixth assessment report in Working Group 1 included many such figures uh, where we are comparing uh, a future time period, in this case, the end of the century, under a low emission scenario and then on the far right here, it's that same time period under a very high emission scenario. Um, this comparison between what the future world looks like, uh, in this case, looking at extreme temperatures, uh, where maximum temperatures uh, exceed 35 degrees Celsius, this comparison tells us how that hazard changes depending on the emissions that we do, with the very low emission scenario having fewer hazards than the very high emission scenario. Um, we can also look at different time periods to see, to see how this evolves over time. Mitigation applications approaches, therefore, uh, need to understand what is that climate condition and how does it evolve along a given scenario or pathway. Uh, an alternative way of looking at this is to focus on emergent global warming levels um, that are connected to uh, various pathways and therefore there are different different trajectories or different decision processes that can lead us uh, to that global warming level. However, we have seen that the climate system often acts in a consistent way at a given global warming level, and therefore we can study it regardless of the, the time and the trajectory it takes to get there. Uh, there are, are trade-offs in this approach, of course, but it is a useful way of looking at benchmark global warming levels. And this is particularly important because of the focus on global warming levels in the recent Paris Agreement and in many uh, negotiations of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So here on the right, you see a figure also from the IPCC uh, looking at December to February period droughts and comparing those at 1.5 degrees global warming to two degrees and four degree global warming levels. This is important, again, from a mitigation perspective, because if we can constrain, uh, if we can contain global warming to lower levels, uh, we have a different prospect of drought risk than if we allow climate change to reach higher levels. Applications for adaptation generally compare a future system with and without a given adaptation intervention. The figure on the right shows crop model projections from my colleague Florian Zabel. Uh, under a moderate emission scenario at the end of the century. We'll explain what these codes mean momentarily. And in this case, we're looking at that future climate period with and without uh, a shift in the particular varieties of cereal crops that are grown. So in this case, uh, what we see is mostly green colors indicating that selecting uh, this adapted seed variety is leading to higher yields under that future climate condition. It's important to note 
that adaptations are, are generally targeted toward a particular climate change factor. You could also get increased yield by simply increasing nitrogen fertilizers, but that is not particularly uh, a climate change adaptation. Uh, if you are targeting climate conditions with your adaptation intervention, uh, that is more likely to be a climate change adaptation. When we're looking at risk management applications, we are generally comparing the change in risk driven by shifting climate hazards, vulnerability, and exposure over time. In the figure on the right, you'll see uh, a, an ensemble of crop model projections uh, that were organized by my colleague, Jonas Jägermeier. And here we're, we have 12 crop models and five climate projections from the EasyMIP project, which we'll describe momentarily. Uh, these projections show decreasing yields as we get to the end of century under this very high emission scenario, SSP 585. And this type of shifting risk uh, allows uh, adaptation or allows stakeholders in the agricultural sector uh, to start thinking about how they can react and be proactive about these shifting risks going out into the future. Um, proactive risks in particular require a different lead time of planning, uh, which is why we, we want to start with this projection uh, to understand how shifts are forming towards the future, giving us enough time to respond uh, and be proactive in those uh, interventions. Now, as we're thinking about agriculture, it's a good, good opportunity to, to understand how systems thinking is important so that we can understand how actions and risks interact with other portions of nature and society. Uh, the, the, inter, the, the, the impact of this type of agricultural production change uh, is not something only felt on the fields, but also through the wider food systems that process and trade and, uh, and lead food products to consumers all around the world. So understanding how these risks uh, connect to larger systems uh, is something that we might be looking to with risk management applications. And in all of these examples, uh, the, the particular nature of these suggests certain types of projection sets that we might look for. Uh, as we're thinking about these climate projection sets, it's worth understanding the origin and the orientation of the groups that are making climate projection sets. The first thing to note is that climate change projections begin uh, with an understanding of the climate system itself. So the foundation of climate change projection comes from the simulations that capture the human influence on the climate system. On the right, you'll see a, a simplified illustration of what climate models are often trying to understand. Um, this requires a detailed understanding of radiation physics, atmospheric dynamics, uh, atmospheric chemistry and ocean chemistry, as well as the dynamics of the ocean, biosphere, the cryosphere, and the human-driven shifts in emission and land use. To understand the climate system, we employ a set of high performance computational models uh, that try to represent the fundamental physical processes and chemical exchanges of our climate system uh, and its interactions with human influence uh, and, and the broader natural uh, climate variations over time. Uh, we, we look at a model that includes vertical levels and a, a global coverage as well as uh, information up into the high portions of the atmosphere and down to the depths of the ocean um, and trying to understand fundamental balances and exchanges throughout this entire system. Climate models require some of the most powerful computers in the world. Uh, on the right is a picture of the NASA Discover supercomputer, uh, which is uh, in, in the United States. And uh, there are co computer systems all around the world uh, running these types of computer models because of the, the sheer uh, size and power required uh, to, to capture all of these interacting physical equations. We also take the climate projection information and constrain it with observational data. Uh, climate models are often designed to capture these global signals, but this can lead to regional biases that we can correct and at least understand by comparing with observations. This is one of the reasons that NASA is so strongly connected to climate, uh, climate science and climate projections. Um, 
Observations are an important part of model development and can also be used to reduce the biases for applications. On the right, you see some examples of some NASA products that are, are trying to uh, capture soil moisture um, as well as uh, the complex nature of precipitation uh, around the world. Climate projection sets are developed for use in specific applications areas. Uh, we apply climate projections for land and ocean ecosystems, agriculture and food systems, water resources, cities and infrastructure, human health, energy, and the evolution of social systems uh, as, as influenced by development and other pressures. Uh, it's important that we, we look to projection sets that can be aligned with the decision context. That means we want to find the information and the temporal and spatial scales that will support specific decisions related to adaptation, mitigation, and risk management. Uh, and in many cases, we, we are trying to find information that matches the specific areas uh, of, of stakeholder control or stakeholder influence so that their decisions can, can align with the climate information provided. When we're producing climate projection sets, it's important to note that, that we construct them according to a number of specific choices, uh, and in many cases shaped by resource constraints. So we highly recommend that, uh, that climate projection sets are, are determined and created in a co-production process that includes uh, scientists, uh, the, the producers of the climate projection sets themselves, and the users of the, of the climate projection set information. Uh, this can be governments, it can be civic organizations, concerned industries, and others. Um, this combination of experts and technical uh, approaches and, and stakeholders uh, is what brings us to regional climate information that is really useful. Um, but this process also has its own influences on the type of information that is produced. So most importantly, it's, it's necessary to recognize the influence of the values of the people involved. Uh, scientists and stakeholders and the producers each come to this process uh, with certain things that they might prioritize or value, uh, whether it is financially or ethically um, or, or other approaches that, that might prioritize the way they approach the process. Um, this is something that uh, there is increasing literature and, and understanding. If you're interested, uh, you can read about in the IPCC, uh, recent chapter 10 in Working Group 1, uh, about how this process really plays out in reality. Um, and, and the way I'll summarize it here is when you, when you understand that applications are limited by resources, including time and money and the computational resources or attention required, um, you start to you start to have to make decisions uh, that can lead you towards certain types of, of information. Um, but in the bottom line, what we're trying to get here are projection sets that that provide an ability to evaluate these specific decisions conditional on future pathways of society and the climate system, um, and through some combination of foresight or forewarning, with a good representation of uncertainty we hope to support that decision-making process. All right, so we are now going to shift towards the, the core distinguishing features between climate projection sets as we're thinking about how we can, we can go into uh, to producing climate change uh, information for decisions. Now, I, I want to take a moment here to look at the image that you keep seeing on these transition slides. This is a, a satellite image looking down on Northern California. Uh, you can see San Francisco uh, on the left side of this figure and, and the Bay Area. Uh, you'll also see the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, but in between here, there's agriculture, there are reservoirs, there are uh, rivers and ecosystems and, and ocean uh, ecosystems and estuaries and other things. Um, you can see the incredible level of detail uh, that might be required to understand those systems and how different stakeholders might need different levels of information to understand these various systems. Um, so as we're thinking about these projection sets, uh, it's important to recognize where we're going with this, which is understanding those decision contexts across uh, specific sectors and, uh, and things that we care about in nature and society. So the first Thing that's important to note whenever a projection set is being considered is the global climate model output that is used. 
Uh, there are now more than 100 different Earth system models, or ESMs, from more than 50 modeling institutions that you can find around the world. Uh, the leading modeling groups have coordinated simulations of climate change scenarios within the auspices of the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, or CMIP, uh, which is now in phase six, which we call CMIP-6. Um, you can find still very easily on the internet and through other data serving platforms, data from CMIP-3 or CMIP-5 or CMIP-6. Um, these are older and, and up to the present version of, of CMIP, but it's important to note that if you're working with CMIP-3 data, that was probably done before about the year 2007. CMIP-5 data was probably done before around 2013, and CMIP-6 data uh, was probably done before 2020. Uh, these are somewhat aligned with IPCC pro uh, assessment processes, uh, but they give you an idea of how old these, these climate projections are. And of course, modeling institutions are constantly improving their models with higher resolution, improved physics and chemistry, and more process understanding. So if you're using an older model, uh, you are potentially going to have those influences of, of uh, model features that we may have corrected uh, in, in the meantime. Uh, so it's important when you're looking at the, the, the climate projection set to first ask, you know, what is the fundamental source of the climate influence, you know, the human influence on the climate system uh, at coming from these global models. Uh, the other thing that's important to note is that CMIP provides important diagnostic and, evalu and, and evaluation information for each ESM. So if you want to understand which climate models uh, you're using and, and what they understand about the climate system compared to observations, uh, you can find that information in the CMIP runs. Uh, there are additional sources of climate projections beyond just the, the global models. Uh, you can get direct access to outputs from a modeling group outside of CMIP. So many of you may have relationships with people at modeling centers like, like NASA GIS where I sit. Um, you can also sometimes get information from large ensembles which use many initial conditions to better understand the internal variability within a climate model. Um, and there are, are uh, large ensemble projects especially being used to understand extreme conditions uh, and, and the, uh, the risks of uh, you know, tail events going out into the future. You might also find climate information that comes from a climate model emulator, which is a statistical representation of the climate system that we can run at, at highly reduced computational cost. In many cases, these are uh, empirical and other approaches that are used to uh, represent climate responses uh, from CMIP outputs, uh, but the resulting statistical model is much cheaper from a computational perspective. And these have often been developed for use in integrated assessment models. Uh, when you're looking at any approach from an emulator, it's important to consider which elements were included in that statistical approach. For example, was the, the uh, emulator designed to capture a global signal, but to not be as concerned about regional detail? Uh, did they focus their climate model emulation on temperature at the and, and not include secondary variables like precipitation or evapotranspiration or river runoff uh, or drought conditions? Um, so it's important to think about which variables are available and their coherence. For example, would you have uh, you know interactions between rainfall and cloudy days or cooler temperatures. Uh, it's also important to, to ask whether the climate model emulator is focusing on average conditions or extreme conditions or even variants from year to year. Um, some statistical approaches uh, may take only global variables uh, are with uh, you know temperature and rainfall only and average conditions. And if you want to use that climate model emulator to understand uh, particularly acute drought conditions in some future period, you, you may not find that information. When we're thinking also about climate projection sets, it's worth asking what are the scenarios and storylines that are available? Scenarios describe a future world through a plausible and internally consistent set of assumptions, potentially including greenhouse gas and aerosol emissions, land use change, socioeconomic development, and, technolo and technological change. Uh, the IPCC notes that scenarios are neither predictions nor forecasts, but are used to provide a view of the implica implications of development and actions. 
so scenarios are really uh, fundamentally uh, uh, fundamentally uh, pictures of the future uh, conditional on a certain set of changes as we go from today out into that future condition. Um, you might also find climate projections that are associated with a given storyline. The IPCC AR6 Working Group 1 defined a storyline as a way of making sense of a situation or a series of events through the construction of a set of explanatory elements. Usually it is built on logical or causal reasoning. Uh, storylines can have societal and physical elements. For example, you might find climate information or climate projections oriented around a major drought in the 2080s that is worth, you know, worthy of, of additional study. Um, it could be looking at the physical implications of a given amount of global warming, like a 1.5 degree global warming level. Um, it also could be a set of conditions stemming from the discovery of a new technology. For example, how would the future evolve if uh, there was a, uh, a, a further uh, dramatic change in green energy? Um, and then you might also look at the ramifications of a given policy or a new financing being implemented. Uh, for example, people follow storylines related to the uh, nationally determined commitments in the Paris Agreement, uh, or you might ask what would happen if there was a new policy uh, mandating electric cars or uh, some kind of new capture storage uh, technique. Many climate projections use a common set of climate scenarios and storylines uh, in projections of the future. Uh, going back to the year 2000, there was a special report on emission scenarios that we call SRES that was designed for the IPCC third assessment report. Uh, there you would find scenarios named things like A2, B1, and A1B. Uh, these types of scenarios were, were quite useful uh, for, for decades of climate research, uh, but at this point we have to look back and, and think of them as old scenarios considering they were developed in 2000 and a lot has changed since then. Following that, uh, for the, for the uh, fifth assessment report, there were representative concentration pathways. Uh, these are pathways that you uh, may have seen labeled things like RCP 8.5. Uh, the numbers being higher generally means larger amounts of climate change. Uh, that is related to the amount of radiative forcing caused by greenhouse gases towards the end of the century. Um, so RCP, uh, uh, 2.6 was, was often considered a low emission scenario and RCP 8.5 was considered the, the high emission scenario. Uh, for the sixth assessment report, uh, there, there was a group within CMIP um, that created these SSP RCP scenarios. SSP stands for Shared Socioeconomic Pathways um, and we combined these with the RCPs to recognize that uh, the, the socioeconomic development and the representative concentrations uh, of greenhouse gases are, are intricately linked. Uh, so when you see scenarios that are labeled things like SSP 370, this is a given socioeconomic scenario, and the number 7.0 is related to the concentration pathway in much the same way as RCP was before. Um, I'll say a little bit more about those in the next slide, um, but on the right is a visualization of what this actually looks like using the climate stripes made popular by Ed Hawkins. Um, you can see uh, the climate system going from pre-industrial conditions all the way up to, uh, to today uh, with warming increasingly evident in the 20th century. And as we go towards the future, there are uh, five different emissions scenarios that we, we would look at. These are illustrative scenarios that are, are labeled simply from very high, high, middle, low, and very low, but with more scientific names, uh, SSP 585, SSP 370, SSP 2, 4.5, SSP 1, 2.6, and SSP 1, 1 1.9. Uh, these scenarios are worth kind of getting to know so that we can understand how uh, these future conditions associated with these scenarios are connected to the emissions uh, themselves. In many uh, applications today, people use SSP 370 and SSP 1, 2, 6, uh, as the plausible high and low end scenarios. Um, as you can see, as we're going forward into the future, the, the more extreme scenarios on both ends are becoming less plausible, pushing us towards these middle scenarios, which still include a huge amount of, of uh, climate uncertainty, 
uh, and societal pathway uncertainty because in the end, our future condition depends on what we decide to do as a society. As I mentioned, we can also look at global warming levels. Um, these stripes also show different colors for you know, one and two and three degree global warming levels, which you can find uh, throughout this, this map. And we may look at storylines like these nationally determined contributions um, as we're going forward. For further information on these SSP RCPs, uh, I want to call your attention to this chart, which was uh, produced by Brian O'Neill um, in describing the scenario MIP portion of CMIP 6. Uh, what you see here is a, uh, a combination of the SSPs, or the shared socioeconomic pathways, uh, representing societal choices around development. Um, and on the y-axis here are the various climate conditions associated with 20, the year 2100 forcing levels. So as I mentioned, SSP, uh, or sorry, I should say RCP 8.5 represents a, a uh, atmospheric forcing from the, the greenhouse gas emissions of 8.5 watts per square meter at the end of the century. Now for any one of these SSPs, there is a certain amount of socioeconomic development and associated emissions given the technologies in those, uh, uh, those scenario pathways. Um, this means that any given SSP has a highest possible level of, uh, of climate forcing. However, it is possible that you could, you could use mitigation to lower the actual forcing levels. And this is the fundamental uh, in information around SSPs, RCPs that are important to recognize is that you can have the same SSP with various levels of climate forcing depending on the amount of mitigation that is done. So an SSP 5, 8.5, which is represented by this blue box here, um, represents a fossil fuel development with very little mitigation. Um, but you could likewise create an SSP 5, 3.4, uh, which is the same fossil fuel development, but now adding in mitigation to keep the climate change to a much lower level. Uh, all of these white boxes here and these and these uh, other boxes are, are scenarios that some climate models have run. Uh, the dark blue boxes are what's considered tier one scenarios that are designed to fundamentally capture uh, the major types of climate change uh, and, and socioeconomic development. So you'll see overwhelmingly uh, this SSP 126, SSP 245, SSP 370, and SSP 585 as uh, the most common scenarios. Um, it's important to note that these compare to the previous RCPs that were within CMIP 5 uh, along these uh, fundamental uh, rows, uh, but as, as noted above, uh, these RCPs are not directly connected to SSPs. Uh, when they were done as a standalone basis. So here again is a signal, if you are looking at scenarios and all they say is RCP, you are probably dealing with older climate model projections. Um, but if you have uh, SSP 585 or some kind of SSP RCP combination, uh, you are looking at CMIP 6 information. So uh, this is uh, one way of, of thinking about scenarios and depending on your application need, you might take the fundamental uh, illustrative scenarios by these dark blues as a starting point uh, or con consider other conditions uh, as your application requires. Another key aspect of projection sets is the extent to which downscaling has been applied. Downscaling is a process by which we bring global model information to a finer resolution, potentially including representation of finer scale features such as land use, mountains, and coastlines. Uh, downscaling can also allow us to, to represent physical processes associated with finer resolution dynamics. On the right here, you see a, a slide by Bill Gutowski uh, looking at features of climate systems that might benefit from more fine scale regional modeling. You'll notice that this includes things like mesoscale uh, processes, such as severe storms, tornadoes, and hail, uh, as well as interactions between uh, precipitation and topography that might be associated with a monsoon, uh, local orography and, and dynamics around mountains and valleys, uh, and features within, uh, within larger systems like tropical cyclones that cannot be captured on, on, uh, on global grid cell resolutions. 
Downscaling has, has several major approaches. Uh, there's dynamical downscaling are situations where we use a fine resolution model driven by global climate model boundary conditions. You might think of this as embedded within a global climate model or nested. Uh, there can even be several nests uh, that allow us to get to fine resolution information. You can also take statistical approaches whereby we uh, we take empirical relationships between fine scale features and, and the large scale conditions that, that may drive those. There are also climate analogs that use weather types and historical conditions to construct a, a set of local conditions associated with the, the current climate state. On the right, you'll see some examples of, of downscaling approaches that were done in an inner comparison over Southeast South America. On the top, you'll see the, the Cortex simulations that are available for, for domains around the world. We'll talk about Cortex more in a moment. And then for this Southeast South America uh, example, there are specific downscaled simulations run at 20 and four kilometer resolution. Uh, and these are compared to some empirical approaches as well, looking at, at rainfall rates in this region. So you can see that this is getting to much finer scale information but that there are also differences between models and between different approaches that we need to understand. Another approach in downscaling is to use machine learning, which is a, uh, a, a advanced form of statistical approaches that, that go beyond uh, traditional regression to automate the process of model improvement. In many cases, this allows for more accurate predictions over time as the model learns and dynamically changes from each iteration. This is one way where we can take multiple data sets uh, as training data, use machine learning approaches to come up with this uh, finer resolution set of climate projections or predictions. Uh, here's another way of looking at this. Uh, if we take a bunch of large scale predictors, including things like winds and uh, temperatures and humidities, we can then push these through different types of convolutions, different types of uh, statistical approaches to come up with uh, observed or, or uh, projected information at a much finer resolution than we would have before. Uh, this is this is a uh, approach used for, for weather forecasting and it is increasingly moving into the climate projection sets as well. There's also a, a set of approaches that use weather types uh, and analogs. By this we mean we use the historical record to provide a set of coherent spatial patterns that are analogous with the condition that is projected by a climate model in the future. That means we go through uh, the historical record for each point to find days in the observational period that match the type of model outputs that we're seeing around this point. Uh, this means we are, are selecting across uh, many different uh, example historical time periods to find the best possible matches uh, and, and then use those to construct the future climate periods, uh, basically taking similar days in the historical period to match out into the future. Uh, this is an example on the right of the LOCA data set. This is the lo localized constructed analog data set that was featured in uh, the previous national climate assessment in the US. And you can see how well we do comparing the downscale conditions with the observed precipitation uh, in this historical example. When we're thinking more about climate projection sets, of course, there are fundamental aspects that are the result of these variety of uh, climate projections and downscaling techniques. This allows us to have a fundamental temporal resolution of the, of the climate projection set outputs. It's important to note that this is the resolution of the outputs rather than necessarily the resolution of the time steps within the models themselves. Uh, climate models often have time steps that, that can be on the order of seconds or minutes. Uh, and when we are putting out our output, they tend to fall on, on things like sub daily, maybe hourly, um, daily outputs, monthly outputs, annual and even decadal summaries uh, may, be, may be available. But depending on what you're interested in and depending on the resolution and the resources that you have, um, you may go for different types of outputs and they may be more or less available depending on what you're looking for. But it's important to note that this, this has fundamental implications for the types of analyses that, that can be done. 
For example, on the right here, you'll just see a set of monthly outputs in the blue and a set of daily outputs in the red. And you can imagine that if you are interested in extreme conditions, whether they're extreme heat or extreme cold, uh, you're not going to get those for monthly values. If, if you want uh, the, the hottest day of the year, you, of course, need to get something like a daily output. But it is important as you're thinking about which resolution uh, or which climate projection set you're after to think about the resolution itself. The other key aspect of resolution comes in the spatial resolution of the climate projection set. Uh, we typically define the spatial resolution as the width of a grid cell, either in kilometers or in a uh, fraction of a degree, latitude or longitude. This can be defined on the, the level of the finest comprehensive output available, but it is important to note that finer resolution does not necessarily correspond to higher quality information, and we'll talk more about this in part two. The figure on the on the bottom shows several different resolution data sets that you might find. Uh, on the left is the EasyMIP data uh, on the order of a half degree. The next data in the middle is on the order of a quarter degree, and the Cortex core data uh, is on the order of a, fifth of a degree. Uh, so these types of resolutions in this domain over uh, eastern Afghanistan uh, are showing how we're capturing different mountains and valleys in that region and the temperatures associated with them. The next aspect of climate projection sets that are worth characterizing is the level of post-processing that was done. Uh, again, this is an approach that is designed to connect the simulation outputs with observed condition. Uh, the, the major category here is around bias adjustment. Uh, we prefer to say bias adjustment over bias correction because we, we rarely can, can get rid of every aspect of bias to correct it, uh, but we can adjust it to reduce bias overall. Um, in that sense, we're trying to match some statistic of observed climate conditions uh, in the historical period and, and carry that into the projections into the future. In that sense, we are rooting our projections in high quality observational data sets using a variety of statistical and machine learning approaches. So let me give some examples of, of what we mean by that. Again, we're looking in this Panj Amu River Basin in Eastern Afghanistan, this larger country here with the, the long neck here is the the uh is afghanistan and in this region on the left you can see the cordex core simulations uh of the 2010 may temperature from one of these models and what we are looking at is the difference between about a fifth of a degree resolution map of afghanistan with what we get from the chelsea database which is on a one kilometer basis and tells us about smaller finer features uh, of mountains and valleys in this region. And this is showing us the, the difference between what we see in Chelsea and what Cortex Core itself has. We can impose these, these finer resolution features into the Cortex Core outputs to create a hybrid data set, um, which includes the fundamental features of the Cortex Core projection, but also includes the mountains and valleys that the Chelsea data set has provided into this hybrid uh, that, that contains both sets of information. This type of bias adjustment uh, is, is based on historical conditions and is carried out into the future. Uh, and in that sense, often assumes that these types of patterns will be consistent going out into the future. Uh, things like mountains and valleys uh, are not expected to disappear overnight. So these types of features uh, are, are considered uh, likely to be quite consistent. We also can do various approaches in post-processing to create scenarios and, and create projections using some form of distribution stretching. What we mean by this is it's a fundamental approach that rather than adjusting the model output to look more like observations, instead we make projections by adjusting the observations to look more like climate change. What that means is we, we take uh, the, the observational information and impose the climate changes to create a new scenario that is uh, is the observations with climate changes added in. Uh, the fundamental approach here is something called the delta method, which takes the projected changes in climate means, uh, so average conditions, for example, on a monthly basis, and adds them into observed data. There's an example of this shown here, where we have taken the, the MERA 2 September uh, sea surface temperatures from 1980 to 2009, 
We have then run climate projections out into the future to this 2050s period under a very high emission scenario, SSP 585, uh, to create a change in temperatures uh, around the, uh, the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Imposing these climate changes into the MERA uh, simulations gives us the, uh, the, the delta method, the delta projections for this region, uh, which include key features that were that were not uh, 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 that were not present in the in the projections uh, or in the climate changes, uh, such as this cooler area just north of the Yucatan, which shows up now more accurately in the future. There are also advanced scaling methods where we change not just the mean conditions, but changes in the climate distribution parameters, such as the mean plus also the standard deviation and maybe the gamma factor if we're using a, a gamma distribution for precipitation. Um, these shifts in distribution parameters can also be used to, to better capture things like uh, shifts in the number of rainy days or the, uh, the extreme characteristics of a given series. When we're comparing the bias adjustment approaches with downscaling approaches, we see some features that are important to recognize. Bias adjustment can impose the observed features, but as we said, it makes this assumptions that these features uh, are persistent out into the future. And likewise, it does not necessarily capture the interaction of those features with climate change itself. On the top of this uh, diagram on the right, which comes from the IPCC, uh, you can see the global resolution simulations uh, for temperature in the March, April, May, spring period over Central Valley and the Sierra Nevada in California in an image very similar uh, to, to what we've seen in our transition slides. When we use bias adjustment, we can impose these mountains and valleys back into this global map uh, and, and have a bias adjusted GCM that captures uh, fundamental characteristics of uh, Central California. When we use a dynamically downscaled model, we can also uh, capture these fundamental features of the mountains and, uh, and have this downscaled information. However, the bias adjustment and the, uh, the regional climate model separate themselves when we go out into the future. So out in the future, now we are looking at the change in temperature uh, in the end of the century period, 100 years after uh, this more recent historical period. Again, the climate models have a, have a coarse representation of this region. Uh, the bias adjusted models look very similar to what you see in the global models, in many cases having a, a, a familiar uh, pattern. But you'll notice that there is not a strong feature of the mountains in here. Uh, and that is because the bias adjustment cannot actually capture interactions between mountaintops and valleys and the circulations uh, associated with those things as we go out into the future. Uh, the regional climate model, however, is able to understand shifts in snow cover and uh, elevated heating and other dynamical features uh, that allow us to see that the climate change is warmer at the top of the mountains than it is down in the valleys. And these types of features where we connect the climate change with the dynamical uh, fine resolution patterns is one of the, uh, the aspects that makes dynamically downscaled model outputs appealing. Uh, so you saw I ran ahead here on this slide, and, and this is a, a, uh, a look at how post-processing is increasingly combining multiple approaches to reach the target information. Uh, so the IPCC Chapter 10 recently noted uh, that you can combine dynamical and statistical approaches to get from these global models up at the top uh, through high-resolution regional climate models, maybe even getting to convection-permitting regional climate models, which we'll talk about more, um, and then drive this all the way through different statistical approaches, including bias adjustment and perfect prognosis of, of connecting large and fine-scale features, maybe even using weather generators to create multiple iterations uh, of, of the future. And this together can give us a, a look at the, the target variable at the target resolution in the future. Now notice here that the solid lines are things that have already been done and are, are somewhat common, whereas the dashed lines are, are much more rare. Uh, it says here have been rarely used and in some cases exist more in theory than in practice, uh, often because of resource constraints and, and potential uh, cascades of, of errors or biases. 
So there, there are pathways that allow us to use all of our best approaches, but rarely are they, are they all employed at the same time. And this is the back to the original uh, idea behind this training is that when you pick up a projection set, it is important to know which choices were made uh, to, to get to the, the final outputs that you're interested in. Another thing that we need to look at in, in terms of deciding which projection set we want to use is whether the variables that we need are available. Uh, we call this uh, the, the set of application ready variables uh, that is available for any projection set. And it's important to note that there are hundreds of, of, of outputs available from a typical Earth system model. When we make climate projection sets, we are typically choosing the variables that we think will be of use for the decision making process. Uh, the most commonly used variables are temperature and precipitation and almost every climate projection set that you get will include those two variables. Uh, however, if you are interested in climate extremes, you need to find uh, projection sets that may feature enhanced information around things like drought or extreme heat, in many cases requiring uh, finer resolution uh, in, in time and space. Uh, there also may be uh, additional information around floods and severe storms, for example. Um, some Projection sets feature additional variables related to energy, such as shortwave and longwave radiation budgets at the surface. Uh, and then there are additional uh, information around hydrology and soils for water resources applications and, hydro and uh, flood modeling, um, and agriculture, if, if you're interested in, in the water balance of, uh, of fields or maybe even ecosystems. There are fewer projection sets that have detailed information around snow and ice, but this may be important to your application, uh, especially if you're related to uh, snowpack or glaciers, permafrost, uh, and, and some water resource applications. Uh, and then marine hazards are, are particularly challenging because many projection sets do not include ocean variables. Uh, so understanding ocean temperature and structure or marine heat waves and ocean chemistry uh, is uh, potentially restricting your ability to, to use all of the projection sets. So with that, we reach the end of part one of our climate projection set training. Um, in this part, we have looked at how mitigation, adaptation, and risk applications have unique contexts that help set the stage for the way we design our scientific assessment and the climate information that we need. Climate projection sets are rooted in climate model understanding and are oriented towards decision making. And the best way for us to get to the climate information we need is by engaging with decision makers uh, in a, in a uh, co-engagement and co-development process. When we're looking at a given climate projection set, there are key characteristics that tell us what we have and how we might best use it. Uh, we've listed seven of these things here and, and gone through them in this first part. They are the global climate models that are used, the scenarios and storylines that are assessed, downscaling techniques that help us get to finer scale information, the, the resulting temporal and spatial resolutions of the climate projection set data, the degree to which post-processing has been done to adjust bias or to create projection sets in combination with observed information, uh, and the level of or the, the extent to which the variables that we need are available for applications, uh, depending on specific sectors of application, um, connecting to the, to the variables that you might need. This first part has set the stage for the second part, which will describe the considerations in choosing a projection set for a given application. So now that we have the fundamentals of how projection sets defer, uh, in part two, we will go through and indicate how a given application might suggest uh, key characteristics and, and key uh, goals or, or uh, areas that are more desirable for our projection sets. Um, so with that, I'm going to close this presentation and look for questions. Thank you very much. Wow, that was a great presentation, Alex. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the participants for your attention throughout this presentation. We will now transition to the question and answer session. Please enter your questions into the question and answer box. 
will answer your questions in the order in which they are received. We will also post this question and answer document for you to use as a reference to the training webpage following the, the conclusion of the webinar. Please feel free to contact myself or Alex should you have any questions about today's presentation. You can also access the training webpage and the RSET website in the links provided below. Also, please follow us on Twitter and check out our sister programs, Develop and Severe. Thank you. Okay, we have been collecting some questions while uh, the presentation has been going on. And if you have further questions, please feel free to type those into the question and answer box and we'll add them to this document. Um, we've been filling in some uh, answers so far. And what I'll do, Alex, is I'll just sort of propose these questions to you and you can uh, answer with what you already have uh, here. Um, <clears throat> but uh, also feel free to expand and we'll capture that. And then for everybody to know, we will uh, eventually post this to the training webpage. So you can use it as a reference uh, in the next uh, few days, maybe by the end of the week. We'll just have to clean it up a little bit and make sure everything's accurate. Um, so I guess I'll start with number one here. Um, so are you aware of any case studies using the CMIP 6 model projections for local studies at the basin scale? Um, so yeah, thanks for the questions and, and for all who uh, made it through the, the first training session and, and are still on after an hour here. Um, yeah, this, this is an interesting question because I'll, I'll take it in a couple different ways. Um, in terms of using climate projection sets to understand basin level uh, applications, there are, there are hundreds of these studies. Many of them still use CMIP3 and CMIP5 outputs because those are available. Uh, and, and in many cases were available a year or two ago when studies were done that are now published. Uh, CMIP6 data have become available just in the last couple of years, and of course, with things like COVID and other things, uh, it, it's been challenging in, in recent years to get all these studies published, um, but they are now coming out. So you, you will see increasingly CMIP6 type studies. Um, they, they use, usually on a basin scale, means we're talking about some form of downscaling and bias adjustment. Uh, so you might look to the Cordex community and to some of the, uh, the projection sets that have come out of uh, the United States, for example, using the LOCA climate data sets. Um, there are basin level outputs. Oftentimes, the ones you'll find published now are using older climate information because it takes that long to, to conduct the study and publish it. Um, but I think already now many of the studies that you see coming out this year are using CMIP6 data and it will be more and more out into the future. Um, because we're looking at basin level scale, you probably want some kind of downscaling or bias adjustment. So I would look to the Cordex community and those who have used the LOCA product in the United States. Um, and, uh, and, and it's also worth noting that the EasyMIP project has run basin level hydrology information uh, for the whole world with, with CMIP6. Um, so there, there are communities now working in that area. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so this, this next one, um, we have quite a bit of an answer here, but the question is, it seems most papers use RCPs, which makes it much easier, but I saw a paper that talked about three degree warming, and I have trouble understanding how that compares to all the RCP-based research. Yeah, so this is a, an important question that, that we tried to address a little bit in the presentation um, around this idea of scenarios and storylines. And this is a fundamental difference that you might find between different projection sets these days, both in terms of using them and in terms of understanding what's already been published. So the key to understand about the RCPs is that the P stands for pathway. These are representative concentration pathways, which means it is a, a trajectory of societal choices and emissions that bring us from today out into the future, usually about the year 2100. So this pathway evolves from present day over time with warming increasing as we're going further out into the future uh, for most of those scenarios. There are some where it peaks and, and starts to decline um, or stabilize, but for the most part, this is a temporal evolution, a temporal trajectory over time. Um, the, the issue is that each climate model, each earth system model and each RCP will warm slightly differently based on the fundamental physics of the climate model and the societal pathways 
um, that are, are within the RCP. Um, that means that the warming may be slightly different from one model to the next. Um, and along that pathway of warming, we may pass these benchmarks of two degrees, three degrees Celsius uh, in terms of global temperature. Um, but what's interesting is if we use those benchmarks, we can actually resolve some of the differences across the models by saying, you know, let's just take all the models at the point where they cross that three degree world or that three degree threshold. And we can actually draw from different models, from different pathways, different time periods, uh, whenever that may occur. So this is, this is intriguing because it allows us to resolve some of the differences between the models. It also allows us to answer fundamental questions about emissions and mitigation policy, because we have shown in IPCC and other literature uh, that, that there is a strong connection between the overall amount of, of greenhouse gas emissions and the level of global warming. So if we understand that our emissions choices are effectively setting the global warming levels, it is compelling to look at the climate associated with those global warming levels. Now, I also note that there are some things where this can get us into trouble. For example, there are variables that lag strongly behind the global warming levels as the climate system equilibrates. For example, the glaciers are melting right now um, and the, the ice caps and the sea levels um, are responding to these, these changing uh, ice mass losses and, and warming of the, of the ocean system itself. So we often see that sea level rise has a strong temporal component that isn't as cleanly associated with the transient uh, global warming levels that we might draw from these scenarios. But that said, there are many other aspects of climate that, that follow very closely with, with the global warming levels. And in many cases, we find that there's more consistency between the climate models when we look at a different level or at a, at a distinct level of warming. So these are slightly different approaches, depends on whether you're doing mitigation or an adaptation or, or risk management study, you might be drawn to these more or less. Great, thank you very much. Question three, is the forcing level the same as degrees of temperature change? Just a little clarification on that point. Yeah, so I think this question was associated with the, the RCPs. So if you remember, there's RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5. That number, so let's take RCP 8.5 as an example, that number is corresponding to the amount of radiative forcing caused by human influences at the end of the 21st century. So in this case, 8.5 watts per square meter of additional uh, radiative forcing. Uh, that is a different unit. It's a different metric than temperature, um, although it's important to say that the higher number of radiative forcing, it, that higher number of associated warming. Um, it's also worth noting that these RCPs, because that number is determined at the end of the century, um, you have to factor in the trajectory, the pathway that gets us there. So the difference between the RCP 8.5 and a lower forcing, uh, a lower emission scenario like RCP 2.6, um, the difference between those isn't very high one year out into the future um, because the, the difference in emissions hasn't had uh, a large influence yet. But as you go further out into the future, the, the difference in emissions has a larger and larger influence on the climate system and those scenarios separate out. So when you're thinking of those numbers, they're, they're instructive, uh, but not the same. Thank you. Question four. On the slide titled Scenarios and Storylines, there was a plot there and it referred to tier two. What did that refer to? So within the, the CBIP6 community, there's a group called Scenario MIP, which came up with these SSP RCP scenarios. And if you recall, this was the slide that had the, the table or matrix of different shared socioeconomic pathways and different representative concentrate, uh, concentration pathways, which together make the SSP RCPs. But as you can imagine, with that many combinations, it is a burden on the climate modeling community to run all of the simulations associated with every one of those specific combinations. So the scenario MIP group set out to, to have different tiers of prioritized simulations, uh, with the tier one uh, combinations being the ones that have the broadest uh, application covering uh, our understanding of different societal and atmospheric responses to our, our human uh, emissions. Uh, so that is going to, uh, to be the most common set of simulations that you'll find. Uh, tier two would be the next most common, 
uh, and then the other ones are harder to find and may require you to get in touch with the modeling groups themselves. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, number five, how do we project future scenarios by using change factors for temperature and percentage change for precipitation together with historical observed temperature and precipitation data? So this is, I think, relating to this idea of bias adjustment or like a delta approach uh, of constructing scenarios. So one thing we can do is we can take the climate model outputs um, that we trust, like the, the broader, larger scale set of, of climate information associated with, with average conditions, seasonal cycles, and the large scale climate response to human systems. And then we can impose things that we know the models have a harder time dealing with, such as extreme temperatures and the day-to-day -day sequences and, and variable uh, uh, combinations that might be important to applications. So in some cases, we can take the large-scale features and then impose the, the daily patterns that we see in observations um, into those large-scale features to better create uh, time sequences and regional heterogeneity uh, along coastlines or mountains or areas with, with uh, heterogeneous land use. Uh, and that is what we often call bias adjustment. We need good observations that we can then impose into the model world. Um, there is an intrinsic assumption there that those, those patterns of high levels of detail that we observe today will persist into the future, which is why we had that conversation about dynamical downscaling, which includes examples of things that might not persist into the future. Um, we can also take the secondary approach where we take observations and impose climate changes onto those. It's a slightly different order of operations. Instead of imposing observations onto model data, we can take model data and impose them into the observations. And this uh, would lead to situations where we have true observed um, sequences and interrelationships between the, the daily um, patterns and the, and the different variables that might be of interest. Um, and in that sense, we, we are able to construct hypothetical uh, future projected scenarios that include the core characteristics of climate change, but are recognizable to the direct station observations or other things that you might be working with already today. So there's slight differences in those two approaches, but it's worth at least asking when you're picking up a projection set of whether these are observations imposed on model data or model data imposed on observations. Okay, great. And, and question six is, is a little similar. And you know, please let me know if you you kind of address the same thing in, in yeah. your answer to question five. We apply the same bias adjustments calculated between observation and baseline. Um, if so, uh, are we not forcing the same historical statistics to future periods? Yeah, so this is what I was just alluding to here, which is if we are applying a bias adjustment based on recent years far out into the future, we have to ask the question of whether those relationships will continue to hold out into the future. Uh, and here I would say that it is um, a situation where uh, experts can look at a given application area and ask questions about how similar um, the future might look, or maybe more specifically, whether the climate change itself will adjust those relationships. Um, so for example, if, if there is an area um, that has uh, you know, large amounts of snowpack uh, or uh, you know, a, a set of, of uh, irrigated conditions or river flow, uh, that is threatened by climate change. If the river flow is reduced or land use change might shift, or if the snowpack melts, uh, imposing those patterns in the future may not make sense anymore. Um, so in that sense, you might have to ask yourself whether you would need specific scenarios of land use and kind of the dynamical nature of those other features. All right, thank you very much. Are RCP scenarios now considered to be outdated and only SSPs should be used from now on? So here I want to draw an important distinction, which is that in the CMIP 5 time period, we used RCPs to represent the, the climate information. Uh, and we used SSPs to represent the societal information. And there was almost an assumption that those things were uh, independent from each other. Uh, so what that meant was, was we, we would have societal pathways go in one direction, 
uh, and then we would treat the, the atmospheric phenomena in kind of an, uh, a separate way and, and then look for interesting combinations. Um, the new approach in CMIP6 is not just to take SSPs, but to take both, to take SSP, RCP combinations um, and to recognize that there are patterns uh, in terms of the way that we respond and the the uh, the response patterns themselves can change the atmospheric phenomena and in general when we're when we're running these simulations we need to understand what our actual storyline is saying now in some cases it might not matter if all we care about is the atmospheric portion um, the societal side may not be as relevant but if we are running uh, as we are increasingly doing uh, climate hazards connected with vulnerability and exposure to create risk, if we're looking at response risk, if we're looking at systems effects, we need to know what is happening in all of these realms. And in that sense, the, the scenarios uh, that include both SSP and RCP information uh, in a designed way are, are more useful. Great, thank you. Um, so a little bit more of a, a data access question or output access question. Um, they're interested in a place that uh, they can get the CMIP6 downscaled data set or earlier data sets of CMIP5 were available on the CIAT site. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a website for CMIP6? Yeah, so uh, I'm guessing the person who, who wrote that question uh, is, is an agricultural expert because I recognize CIAT um, as one of the, the big CG centers looking at agricultural research and applications around the world. Um, there are there are actually lots of of groups that are are putting out different sets of information um as it looks like some people have already put some some resources uh in that response here um we will talk a little bit in the second training session around uh some of the online tools that might make these available um some of the ones that i mentioned today include the the next data set and easy mip uh, and we now have some links there that, that you'll be able to find. Uh, I'm guessing that Brock might be putting them in the chat or something like that. Um, but they are uh, increasingly available and um, you will see some more resources on that in the future. Now there's also the direct climate model outputs which you can get from the Earth System Grid Federation. Um, but as you saw today, uh, just taking direct climate model outputs usually isn't enough for a full application that further process of downscaling and bias adjustment and, and uh, you know, other processing is, is quite important. That really feeds into question nine. It's just a clarification. Is downscaling a type of post-processing always, or is it somehow different? Um, from their understanding, all downscaling, downscaling is post-processing, but not all post-processing is downscaling. So, um, the, the, there's a little bit of a, of a semantics thing here, which, which might not be incredibly relevant. Um, when I'm talking about post-processing in this context, it would be something that is done after the climate model output has already been simulated. So the global climate models produce a set of outputs, and then the dynamically downscaled uh, models might pick up those climate model outputs and process them further with their own simulations. Um, that using post-processing might be a, a too general term that, that some dynamical models might object to. And it is, of course, also possible to, to have them all embedded together. There are some climate modeling groups that have nested grids in their, in their global model, and it is all run together um, so that they can get kind of more and more detail over uh, domain of interest. Um, I think in general, semantically, it's, it's less important than understanding kind of what the process is. Um, now, there are certainly, um, let's see, not all post-processing is downscaling. That's certainly true. Um, other, other things like bias adjustment can be done at, at multiple scales, um, and it it's, uh, may, may have different motivations than purely just downscaling. Um, so again, if we think of post-processing as things that you do with the model outputs from the climate models, to, from the global climate models to make them more useful, I would say that there are many aspects that could be brought into that into that overall uh, set of approaches. Great, thank you. What is the role of the trends from observational historical data in building climate change scenarios? And I, I think that you pretty much addressed this in your presentation, however. Um, but is there anything further you'd like to say on that? Yeah, I actually think that the 
the um, question is is pulling at something quite interesting, which which we didn't discuss too much, um, which is that there can be a, a gap, there can be a uh, a perceived difference between the historical trend and the climate projection set that picks up as we go into the future. And this is something that's certainly worth being aware of. Um, in some cases, it's difficult to separate the natural variability um, of decadal changes and, and other things that might have happened in recent years to give the impression of a, of a trend in a certain direction, which the climate models themselves may not hold. Um, if it's a different scale of variability or internal uh, atmospheric and climate processes, uh, it's probably worth understanding that way and not tossing future climate projection sets that may disagree with the uh, the instantaneous trajectory of, of those changes. Uh, in some cases, they, they may point to uh, a potential bias in the model that is worth further understanding. Um, for example, in some portions of East Africa right now, there is a strong drying trend when many of the climate models indicate a future that will be wetter. Um, that is worth thinking more about and asking if there is a need to, uh, to, to select models that are, are more likely representing uh, the recent trends. But as I just mentioned, there, there needs to be further analysis of whether that, his, that historical trend in East Africa is related to some other larger mode of variability which might reverse in years to come. Um, we have seen that in other portions of the world. Um, for example, in Southeast South America, there is also uh, decadal trends that, that many people are studying. Um, so I think it's worth understanding that, but it, it's also, um, you know, oftentimes indicative of further study that is needed to, to make sense of that. And to, in the, the next training, we'll talk about how you might select storylines uh, to ensure that you are at least considering situations that, that are um, of particular interest given recent trends. Thank you. And that brings us to number 11. Uh, we have about six minutes left of the Q&A session. Right, if, we don't get to all, yeah, if we don't get to all the questions, we'll, we'll do our, our best to address these before we post them, so you know. Um, so. We, can, we just had a lot of questions and we had about 400 people online here today. So um, 11, given the difference in the level of development in different countries around the world, how do the existing projections consider the differences uh, to offer an in-depth information of current and future scenarios and adaptation, yes. adaptation interventions required based on country scenarios? So I'm gonna keep this a little bit short because it's gonna be part of the focus of the second training session, um, but I'll just note that the, the the amount of data in a given region is something that, that needs to be taken into account. Uh, relatively data-rich environments have uh, a better capacity for bias adjustment and weather analogs because we, we have a higher understanding of what is happening in those climate zones, um, whereas areas that are relatively data sparse uh, might be more difficult to rely on observations and may require a, a larger dependence on our physical understanding to fill in the gaps. Um, and then, of course, when it comes to the specific applications, there's a whole other set of questions around opportunities to adapt and mitigate um, and the decision processes that would support those. Thank you. Yeah, and um, please, uh, whoever asked that question, if others are interested in the same sort of thing, uh, please is tune in tomorrow. Question 12, do you know why the interactive CMIP 6 mapping tool from IPCC took down their large hydraulic basin level data? I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with, with this or not, so uh, feel free to uh, answer if you can. If not, we can move on. Yeah, so this kind is a question thing. about the CMIP 6 mapping tool from IPCC. I'm assuming that's the IPCC interactive atlas. Um, I had not been aware that they had taken down a hydrologic basin level data, um, so I have to I have to say I don't have a, a, an informed answer on this question right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, that might have been a, a little. You're not responsible for that, so <laughs> maybe you don't know why that was taken down. Um, Okay, so this is kind of specific, but it might apply to other areas too. Um, it's calculating the, the mean of long time series, say the Mera 2, 
Um, it, it changes, if changes are already happening or happening now, should the values of all years have the same weight for calculating the mean? In this context, yeah, so, it would be appropriate to correct. Um, so yeah, the, the, the question raises a very important point, um, which is that it, it's always nice to have a long time series of data, uh, but we are in a non-stationary climate. The climate system is changing. And in that sense, if you are adjusting your bias, it's an important question to understand what is your reference period? And in all honesty, uh, what you want is a period that is most representative of the system as we understand it today. So often we, we lean towards a, uh, a more recent decades, uh, but we also want it to be a long enough time period that it represents something like a climatology, by which we mean it includes the fundamental statistics of that local climate. Um, which cannot be, be determined on just a short time frame. So the World Meteorological Organization encourages a 30-year time frame for climatological studies. Sometimes you'll see that shortened to 20 years, although there's some caution around that, depending on which variables you're, you're interested in. Certainly you cannot expect uh, by rule to have a 100-year flood uh, occurring in, in a 20-year period. Now that said, if you have a longer time series, you might get better information about tail behaviors. Uh, but you have to ask the question of whether those tail behaviors are interacting with the long-term trends. Um, but you may be able to use statistical processes to understand uh, some of the larger uh, variability uh, and, then, and then connect that with ongoing trends to understand what might happen down the road. Great, thank you. Okay, um, we're gonna try to attack one more question here um, before we sign off for today. Um, keep the questions coming in, however, but uh, question 14, regarding the data extracted from the NetCDF files from Cordex, if you're familiar, how can we check for data validity? Um, I usually use the coding to get the rainfall temperature data and clip the regional data to the study area. How can you know the data validity after coding? Uh, so there's a, there's a, a, a set of experience here that that um, I don't want to claim to, to have the only solution to these problems. Um, but I would just say that the, that my first piece of advice would be that nothing beats a, a site check. Um, if you have extracted data from a NetCDF file and you want to make sure that it's the variable that you want, the units are correct, that there have been, you know, whatever scaling factors and offsets applied, um, and that the, the orientation of your domain is what you think it is. Uh, the very first step that I usually do is plot out a simple map like average temperature um, and compare it against an independent resource that would give me an idea of, uh, you know, basic patterns and levels of temperature that you might find just to see kind of if you're actually where you think you are and, and haven't somehow inverted northern and southern latitudes or uh, rotated the, the X and Y axis or some other thing that, that many of us have probably done uh, in the past. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we are going to sign off for today. Thank you very much for your time here, Alex. Uh, it was a great presentation and uh, please everybody join us tomorrow for part two of the series. And we're gonna get really into um, different considerations and caveats that one should keep in mind uh, when choosing uh, the particular projection sets for your for your application or storyline. Um, Alex, is there anything that you wanted to say before we close off for today? No, I, 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 uh, I'm really excited to have had this opportunity to speak with all of you. I understand that this may have been too technical for some of you and too simple for some of you. Um, our hope here really was just to provide some some foundational pieces. Uh, and I would encourage you uh, to take this to, to your level of expertise and, and understanding and, and see if these foundational building blocks are something that can help you either in designing or identifying or using these, these data sets for your applications. Um, as, as the co-director of the Climate Impacts Group at NASA GIS, we generally are doing our best to follow what's happening around the world, um, but I'm sure that there are things that we have missed and uh, we would encourage this community to, to be more and more uh, engaging and uh, and and really think fundamentally about uh, how climate projection sets are used and created uh, and the intersection of those two things hopefully for the best decision support around the world so thanks again and uh, I look forward to being in touch with all of you 
thank you. Have a nice evening, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.